And they have two EV stations on the Indian Canyon side yeah. there in the parking oh. lot. Good to know. I saw those today. Starge point. All right. Um, so this is April 20th at 5.32 p.m. And it is the monthly meeting of the Sustainability Commission here in the city of Palm Springs. Um, we are recording and I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Roy. Thank you, Patrick. Good evening, everybody. The April 20th meeting of the Palm Springs Sustainability is now called to order. Um, before, we, before Tracy does the roll call, I'd like to announce that we have um, Alex O'Connor and Jake Torrens with us tonight. They were recently um, appointed by the city council to be members of the commission. And in, in a few minutes, they will be uh, sworn in. Tracy, will you do the roll call, please? You're on mute, Tracy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Vice Chair McCann. Present. David Friedman. Present. Jennifer Fetterman. Greg Gauthier. Present. Carl Baker. Here. Jim Flanagan. I'm here. Lonnie Miller. Here. Sandra Garrett. Here. Alex O'Canis. Here. Jake Torrens. Present. And of course, Chair Clark. Thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, someone from the city clerk's office here to uh, swear in Alex and Jake? Yes. So I'm Monique Lomelli, Chief Deputy City Clerk. Um, I'll go ahead and swear in Alex first. Uh, congratulations on your appointment. Um, if I'll have you just repeat after me. Uh, I, please state your name, do solemnly swear. I, Alex Oconius, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter upon which I am about to enter congratulations Commissioner thank you Thomas. but Jake Torrance congratulations to you as well if you'll please repeat after me I, state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm. I, Jake Torrens, do solemnly swear and confirm. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, to the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental re reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and that I will well and faithfully, discharge the duties, discharge the duties, on which I'm about to enter, on which I'm about to enter. 
Congratulations, Commissioner Torrance, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Monique, and <clears throat> welcome to our new commissioners. Um, before I ask Tracy to ask the um, guests to um, identify themselves, I'd like to ask Alex and Jake if they would speak for two or three minutes just to give a little bit about their background and uh, what they're most interested in in sustainability. Alex, would you go first? Sure. Um, nice to meet all of you, at least virtually for now. Uh, my name is Alex Okanya. So the last name can be a little tricky sometimes. Typically, it has a little tilde over the end. Um, so it sounds like a yeah. sound. Um, I just moved to Palm Springs almost two years ago. Um, I moved here from the state of Montana to take a job at the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens, where I work as their conservation social scientist, which means that I deal with um, the different human aspects of conservation, politics, economics, um, just our belief systems and how to best um, navigate those human dimensions and empower them to really uh, create and achieve uh, better conservation outcomes for wildlife and people as well. And I, I mostly grew up in uh, North Texas. I went to middle school, high school, um, my undergrad, there and um, that was where I kind of took my first steps into the sustainability field working as a coordinator for environmental studies there where I did lots of different types of sustainability reporting greenhouse gas reports um, etc since then my interests have um, evolved slightly where um, like I mentioned at the beginning I focus more um, on these human dimensions of conservation so my my graduate degree is in um, resource conservation. Um, and, and to respond to my interests, um, they mostly revolve around just that. How do we best um, engage people in our solutions and, and really make sustainable communities that work best for um, everyone involved? And, and I also, I like to dabble in kind of the education outreach um, aspects as things of, of things as well. So thank you for um, having me all here. I, I, or having me here. I can't wait to work with you all more in the future. Thank you, Alex and, and Jake. Yes, and also it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually today. Um, so I, I hail from, I, I moved to Palm Springs in September um, during COVID from San Francisco where I'd lived for over 20 years. Um, I had been gradually making my way west where I grew up in Nebraska, Omaha, and went to university in Arizona where I uh, studied in soil and water science. So I had my bachelor's in soil and water science with a focus on environmental science, where then I spent over 15 years cleaning up contaminated soil and groundwater. It was in that work that I discovered my passion for sustainability more about really addressing the externalities with cleaning up our precious resources. It was through that work that I then developed more of a focus with sustainability, as I mentioned, layered in with management consulting. So finding different tools and tactics to drive sustainability solutions by working within teams, et cetera. So my real nurture is like the work happens. It's not the what, it's the how and working with individuals, teams, organizations um, has been really powerful. I currently serve as a sustainability advisor for an international sustainability consultancy named Qantas. And I work there with uh, multinationals to help them identify, um, well, we do corporate footprinting, materialities, et cetera. Um, but essentially it's using the science-based targets and corporate footprinting um, mechanism to, social, or to operationalize sustainability and achieve ambitious targets around science-based targets. And so I'm just really excited to be collaborating with all of you as we connect with this community. And it's a great honor to be here and to work with you. Per personally, like my, my special interests now are taking beautiful walks in this gorgeous place. Um, going out to eat, traveling, that's been obviously put on pause and I'm eager to get that kicked back started. But yeah, overall, oh, I cycle and like exercise, et cetera. So just delighted to be here and an honor to be serving with all of you. Thank you. 
thank you, Jake, and welcome again to both of you. Um, Tracy, uh, looks like we have some visitors. Could you um, ask them to identify themselves and their city or affiliation? Yes, let's start with Christian. Can you introduce yourself and let us know uh, what organization you're with? Absolutely, uh, just here to listen in, but uh, my name is Christian Bilson. I'm a resident of Desert Hot Springs and uh, I'm a political organizer that just shifted into uh, environmental organizing and I started a new coalition called the Inland Empire Climate Action Coalition. Uh, we're currently meeting monthly and I'm um, just making the rounds trying to build coalitions and partnerships and stuff like that. So uh, this is my first meeting with you guys and pleasure to be here. Look forward to listening. Welcome, thank you. Uh, next, is it Hoyan? Yes, I am Hoyan, yep. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I mean, I'm so flattered that every visitor get to speak. So um, I am with the Sierra Club. Um, I actually have been just uh, quietly observing what the city is doing since uh, last year. So yesterday I finally decided to call Patrick because uh, he gave a really impressive presentation on the plastic ban to council last summer. And so since then I started to pay attention to the city stuff. And so I figured, well, might as well just check you guys out today. So thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you. And Deborah. Hello, um, again, Deborah McGarry, um, 30 year resident in the Coachella Valley actually moved here directly to Palm Springs in 1988, um, I don't live in Palm Springs now, I live actually down in La Quinta, but um, I also uh, work for SoCal Gas, but I've been kind of following some of the stuff you guys have been working on. Definitely interested in hearing about what your focuses are with regards to hydrogen fueling stations. I think that's a um, interesting topic, but just pretty much just, you know, interested in some of the stuff you've been doing. I've had some conversations with Patrick. Um, he's asked for some information that I've been able to provide him to our account executive. But other than that, that's it. Um, so again, it's nice to see everybody. Um, and again, I like some of your comments and, and, and enjoy some of the things that you've said. So I'm also a member of Friends of the Desert Mountains, too, for those of you that don't know. So yeah, truly support our desert. Thank you and welcome. That must be all of our visitors. Thank you, thank you, Tracy. Uh, for the visitors, there will be time for public comments later in the meeting. Please keep your microphones muted during the meeting and then raise your hand to be called to speak and then unmute your microphone at that time. The next item on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. It was emailed and posted on Thursday, April 15th. Is there a motion to accept the agenda? Motion to accept. Rob? Second. Second. Is that great? Is there any discussion on the agenda? And all in favor of accepting the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda is accepted. Now we'll move on to staff comments by um, Patrick. Um, I believe all of them are covered in the memo in the agenda packet, but Patrick uh, will uh, go into a little bit more detail on some of them. Right. Uh, thanks, Roy. And I do have a few updates uh, to what I had prepared earlier. So one is uh, on April 22nd, I will be doing a little uh, presentation on some of our Earth Day related activities um, and also announcing, uh, recognizing some of the neighborhoods who participated in the, the neighborhood, um, uh, the neighborhood environmental challenge. And so that'll be on the 22nd. Um, the other thing that is not listed here on the 22nd is a presentation and staff report on the capital improvement projects for the um, wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so I was unaware that that was going onto the agenda, but um, Roy pointed that out to me today. So um, that agenda item is included. It is the very last agenda item for April 22nd. Um, my quick read of that very long staff report is that um, there's more research to be done. 
um, on the topics that we care about. Um, and so it's uh, a little unclear to me that any decisions will be made um, at that time um, uh, on any, in any major way. But I would encourage you guys to look at that staff report and uh, see if you want to make any public comments related to that staff report um, before Thursday. So uh, the staff report can be found on the city's website, uh, palmspringca.gov, go to um, government and then go to um, uh, council, uh, council, upcoming council meetings. Um, the other thing is for, with regard to the May meetings, they have pushed up the discussion of uh, the um, foodware ordinance. So that will be held on May 6th. Uh, so that will be coming up at the next meeting. Um, and then the other thing that may come up at the May 6th meeting is the extraordinary rate incre increase request from Palm Springs Disposal Services um, <clears throat> that if we're able to pull that together in time, otherwise it will move to the May 27th meeting where we will also discuss the delinquent trash um, payments. So uh, big meetings in May, I believe. Uh, the other thing I was going to just remind people about, if you haven't already, is the mywaterpledge.org. Uh, please fill out that uh, survey and also the um, survey on organics. Um, and then also a reminder that our uh, pedestrian safety surveys will be closing as well. So if you haven't provided input on those, please do so. Um, the other update with regard to this information is I wanted to uh, ask uh, Commissioner McCann, if he could uh, provide me with maybe a little bit more information about a recommendation for a light meter. And so, uh, so I can go out and take some measurements. I'm a little bit confused by the, uh, some of the measuring tools that are out there and the, what readings they provide. So, um, so I will make that request. Yeah, I noticed that uh, City Council had asked for clarification on that, and I will uh, investigate it and provide it. The, the readings that I took were from um, an app on my phone. And the big issue that I need to get established is how far away from the lighting fixture are you supposed to be when you take these readings? Right. I haven't been able to find guidelines on that yet, but we need we need those, yeah. Yeah, so so any guidance you could provide me on, on the way to collect that data would be very helpful. Yep. Great. Um, hydrogen fueling stations, I did have a follow-up conversation uh, with a gentleman from an organization whose name is escaping me at the moment. Um, but he basically makes connections between people who are interested in hydrogen fueling stations and uh, the station developers, as well as the state. And so uh, they are a public-private partnership. And uh, he basically, I informed him that there had been some interest from residents here in Palm Springs about in, uh, adding some hydrogen fueling stations in the city. Um, he did indicate that there was a lot of interest in the Palm Springs market by hydrogen fuel uh, fueling station development companies. Um, and essentially he forwarded my um, request to three companies who may already have funding and may already be targeting the area. So um, I will provide you with additional information as I get it on that front. Um, and uh, I'll keep you posted on that. But it was a very promising conversation. And um, the only thing he did mention that uh, is a little bit uh, maybe different than I had imagined was that they try to focus on existing gas stations. Um, and so they prefer to put the hydrogen fueling stations into existing gas stations because the fill up time is similar um, and uh, the infrastructure is, is or, or, or rather they're trying to promote a more integrated infrastructure. So. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. It, it, again, it sounded kind of interesting. The timeline for developing these stations is pretty long. So it could be like a year to two years. Um, so again, I'll provide you with more information if I do get contacted by one of those companies. Um, and I think that was, I think those were the only updates on, uh, on the material I provided. So happy to answer any questions on what uh, what was in the report. All right. So hearing no questions, we'll move on to public comments. Uh, do any of the guests present tonight have any public comments to make? 
And if so, then I'll go through my normal spiel about time limits. Okay, it appears that there aren't any uh, public comments, so that we'll um, move on. Uh, Roy Huyen has her hand raised. Oh, yes. Hi, so this is Huyen. Uh, so that was good to hear Patrick's uh, report, uh, what's coming up on, on the uh, May 6th uh, council agenda. So, um, I, we will fully support the plastic ordinance. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. This will, this will make SoCal proud, thank you. Um, another thing is that the timing is just perfect because of SB 1383 that requires um, contamination, actually eliminating contamination. So let's start with reduction. So this is absolutely a step towards the right direction. And another thing yesterday, I was at a different city meeting and they were even saying, well, shall we go to recyclables? I'm like, no, 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 guys, look at the Palm Springs, <laughs> it's composter boats. Um, so another thing is that, um, so Patrick mentioned um, for that council meeting um, that you are talking about the uh, um, collection rate raise, uh, so um, yeah, that's a situation the whole state is facing due to uh, this recycling bills, but that's really the very small cost we can pay for climate resiliency. So uh, we will support that too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hoyan. Does anybody else have a public comment? It doesn't, it doesn't appear that way, so. The next item on the agenda typically is presentations. We don't have any scheduled tonight. And then the next item is meeting minutes, approval of the meeting minutes for the March 16th regular commission meeting. The, me the minutes were emailed and posted on Thursday. Is there a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Oh, thank you. A second? A second. Thank you, Sandra. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Then all who were at the, the last meeting, um, please say yes if you approve the minutes. Yes. 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 Any opposed? So the meetings, the meeting minutes have been approved. Now we'll move on to old business. And the first item is sustainability scholarship and home energy assessment audit status and feedback. I believe that's Tracy. <laughs> so um, let me get down to that. My apologies. I wasn't prepared. I'm, I'm in meeting okay. minute mode. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so we uh, we just wanted to provide you with the updated numbers. As you can see, we're about um, 32,000 um, reserve or given out for sustainability, which is awesome. Um, and recycling, we're at about 7,600. Um, so we still have more room and more uh, money to give away should people be interested. We are promoting uh, this more again with our um, uh, water, uh, our um, sprinkler awareness week, sprinkler check week. Uh, so we may get some businesses who, who follow up on that invitation. Um, I wanted to just point out one um, item in particular. We did get a request from a company called um, Cetrix. Um, they have a UV light um, disinfection system that they were inquiring as to whether or not people uh, in businesses could apply for funding to help offset the cost of the installation of this equipment. Now, in the past, uh, the um, commission had uh, not supported a UV light disinfection system, uh, but it was a more of a wand unit. So uh, I just wanted to get your input on this unit, which is a little bit different and robust. Um, but uh, I wanted to just see if you had any different thoughts about this unit or if you were similarly inclined to not support these kinds of purchases. 
So it performs the same function, basically. It's just bigger and more expensive. You got and it. It seems like the same thing to me. I'm not sure why we would very deny one and approve this one. Right. Okay. Um, my thought on this was that I couldn't relate it to energy, water, waste reduction, conservation, which I think <laughs> are our primary objectives. So uh, I have kind of same answer that I gave for the previous unit for me. Thank you. Thanks. And I reacted the same way as David did. All right. We'll see I don't know right. if we're still yeah. responding to hand raising or not. If we aren't, please clarify, Roy. But the CDC, within the last two weeks, uh, noted they've, they've studied that as far as surface cleaning, it's not applicable for COVID-19. Now, whether this is applicable for the next virus, I couldn't say, but for COVID-19, this actually probably is not even applicable. All the wiping down of the carts and all this stuff apparently is doesn't even relate to COVID. According to the CDC at the New, in the New York Times uh, in the, within the last week and a half or two, so I would say this is a waste of money. Mm -hmm. okay. we, can, we can research that further, but. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't think there's any need. All right, thank you for that feedback. Um, so that was really the only item on that one, unless you guys have any questions about any of the money uh, expenditures to date. All right, so. Next item, uh, all right, uh, also under um, the uh, old business is the greenhouse gas inventory update. So we did meet with the consultant during the uh, solar and green building subcommittee meeting earlier this month. And they did just kind of review the status of the reports and um, the information that they provided. Uh, they, we did clarify with them uh, some additions to make to the reports uh, about the baseline data. So as you might remember, the 1990 data is the baseline that we're reporting to. Um, and as they it's indicated, the, um, the practice is typically to take 15% 15 15 reduction of your 2010 numbers to get an updated 1990 baseline. And um, instead of doing a, another redo of the 1990 data, because it's just too inaccurate and there were too many assumptions that we need to be made. So, so they included some information about that as well as um, the um, new baselines that we would have based on adjusting the 1990, 1990 baseline. I'm sorry, the new goals that we would have based on the uh, adjusted 1990 baseline. So those revised reports are included in the attachments um, the other thing is that they are still working on the 2020 look ahead. So they are going to be estimating the emissions for 2020 based on relatively permanent changes that they anticipate would have happened in 2020. So uh, those are things like desert community energy, where we can point to very specifically uh, how many people are now on 100% carbon free energy, et cetera. So that's what they'll be doing here in the coming week or two. I had hoped that they might have it today, but they aren't quite done. Um, and the other thing is um, Lonnie had a question about the waste related emissions numbers. And um, it did prompt me to remember that I hadn't gotten from them the backup data. So they actually, the underlying data that they use to make these calculations. So they are providing that and I will have that probably this week. Um, and we can take a look at that and see if there's anything that jumps out at us in terms of uh, any anomalies there. But uh, we just wanna double check uh, to make sure that they were using the correct data and, and actually that they were documenting where they got data because um, uh, greenhouse gas inventories are a, a process and we want to be able to continue and uh, update this process as we move forward. So uh, that additional backup data is gonna be important to us going forward. So I wanted to ask if uh, folks had any questions about the reports. Um, all right, Rob, I see you and Lonnie right. and David. So we'll go with Rob and then Lonnie and then David. Um, so two things struck me. Uh, one was how close we are actually with their revised numbers for 2018 
to the 1990 rollback requirements, I mean, we're, we're within the noise of getting to 496,000. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that really struck me, Patrick, was the steep reductions that the city of Palm Springs is asking for in the next 10 years. And is, is there going to be a plan drawn up to how to meet those much more stringent metrics? David Friedman will be doing, doing that before he leaves the commission. <laughs> okay. So I, I think the answer to your question is um, that is something that we will likely revisit as we hit um, get into the strategic planning effort that we had intended to start at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we need to, of course, revisit given the new data that we have. So uh, we'll take a look at that um, and see what's feasible. Um, and again, because so much of those emissions are transportation related, mm -hmm. um, they, it seems like it, it will be a real challenge for us to get down to those levels uh, in the future. So uh, we can continue to, to kind of tweak around the edges for new construction and, and buildings and things like that. Uh, but again, I, I think it, it's going to be a challenge for us to get down to that mm -hmm. level. So I think we're going to have to reevaluate what it is that, that we're shooting for. Okay. So, so yeah. So Lonnie. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. No. You just remuted yourself. I there couldn't when we had those little things, stand up things on the table, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, it's a it's an exciting report. I think it's pretty close to being done. But I think going out into the public and using this, especially as an, as an outreach tool is pretty worthless. Mm -hmm. And the main reason is, well, I'll just give this as an example. I'm on the standing committee on waste reduction and the subcommittee goal is to divert 90% of waste generated by the city of Palm Springs from landfill by 2030, okay? This landfill, Palm Springs landfill is nowhere reflected in this report. I mean, nowhere. There's one landfill, it's Edom Hill. It's been derelict for years and years and years. Let's see if I can tell you how long I had that, but it hasn't been used. It's a, it's a landfill. It's producing lots of greenhouse gas emissions, but it is not one that has been characterized as being able to undergo uh, the flaming, you know, the, uh, the tools that to increase the temperature enough so that there's no more flaring from it. In other words, we have the greenhouse gas emissions, unless they come up with new technology, are what they are from Edom Hill. Now, Edom Hill, interestingly, as I've talked to these, these folks before, very nice people, but Edom Hill actually is not in Palm Springs any longer. It's kind of a, it's a weird segment of it. And I don't even know how the geology is described by the city, but our landfill on the other hand, and this was the handout that I had sent to Tracy and I wish we could just take a peek at it. I um, it. Shows. Switch that, over. What? Let me just switch over to it. I think okay, I that'd it be here. great. Uh, Oh. Uh-oh. Can you see that? Yes, perfect. Oh, it turned out really well. Um, so this was sent to me by Riverside County, basically, and our biggest landfill, which is Lamb Canyon. And you see, that's the lowest one. We have uh, our, some of our um, landfill solid waste material is sent to Badlands, El Sobrante, but you see small amounts. And they, they determine this by the tickets that the 
the, uh, the drivers get when they roll it in. So our, by far and away, our biggest land, uh, landfill is Lamb Canyon. And you see, this was uh, the, the most recent, now there's probably another one coming out soon. We have, let's see, that was, okay. 2018, 1231, 2018, 80,000 megatons of CO2 equivalent. Now that is by far the largest greenhouse gas emission that Palm Springs delivers to this planet. There are other communities that deliver their landfill stuff there but this is specifically what Palm Springs delivers. Why are they collecting these numbers? We're not even using them. Because when I spoke to them, they put this in some kind of other jurisdiction, which because it's in a geographically different jurisdiction, it's not included. Now, when the original greenhouse gas inventory came out, it was included. So I refer you back to that to look at the comparison and to see we've, that this is where the work has to be done. It's in the landfill, it's in, it's in the biogas department and we can do all of the composting and the recycling and we gotta, if we wanna make a dent, this is where the money's at. Okay, but so take that away. It's still, if you, if you don't, you can still use this report. And I would suggest, please don't go on with it any longer. Let's just, come on people, this is inspiring enough. We just have to tell everybody when we go out and we do our outreach that that ain't nothing folks. Look what we have here, this is our landfill. Thank you. Uh, David and then Jake. And I just I just wanted to clarify that I believe that that data is for tons of material that of waste that we send to those landfills. Um, and that the emissions calculations are based on those shipments. So that's one thing we're trying to clarify with our um, uh, consultant to make sure that they were using that number and not some other number. So, so David. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Vice Chair McCann for raising what, what, what I had already prepared as my remark is to say, what's the plan? And obviously that's something we're working on. And I, I, I think uh, we can, as I mentioned, Patrick, we'll can re recycle a lot of what we already did for the climate action roadmap can go into the staff report to at least have kind of some directional information to council. And I think a lot of this has to be referred to the general plan update and sort of the strategic plan. So um, I, I agree with you. That's clearly my mission in the, I think, 14 months that I have left on, on the commission. So thank you for that. Um, I, I note with some degree of, I won't say sort of fear, but there's a good, very good article in today's LA Times um, from our good friend Sammy Roth saying that even the aggressive goals of 40% reduction by 2030 and 80% by 2050, they say that's not enough. Um, and actually it should be 80% by 2030. So um, that kind of raises the other question, Patrick, is that when you get the 2020 sort of number, I think it would be helpful, horribly scary, but helpful to um, work with PlaceWorks to actually create a kind of a bar graph so that you have kind of the 1990 baseline, you know, which is 15% below 2010. Then um, it spikes up to 2010, then additionally small increase in 2018, then hopefully a reduction in 2020. And then you show sort of where we would need to go just assuming the 40 by 30 and 80 by 50. Um, uh, because even with all the reductions between 2018 and 2020, particularly with DCE, the, that, that slope will be a lot steeper um, in the next 10 years and the next, ne ne next you know, 30 years. 
Um, so uh, even if we accept, you know, what we currently have, um, I think that would be helpful because I think that graph will, will, will show an awful lot of what we need to do. So uh, we can work with that. You think Patrick will have a draft for the uh, committee meeting uh, in two weeks? That'd be great. Okay, yep. that's fine. We can work on that. Eli can join. Yeah, in fact, I should have all that backup data too. So just in case. Great. You... Okay. Neil, I can join us if he's available, then we can discuss it and then, you know, do any final tweaks. But I am happy um, with sort of at least where it was and, 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 and clearly respond to the comments we had at our uh, discussion two weeks ago. Okay. So uh, that's Great. it. A lot of work ahead. All right, Jake. I just wanted to offer my support in any roadmap planning if there's needed. Um, this is what I do regularly. Um, and I think that it is important to keep these inventories in mind, even though it's not very sexy or accessible data. I think it's really to avoid any type of passion related projects where you're really looking to address where your actual emissions are. So um, one thing I wanted to point out, and I think that Patrick, you mentioned it was sort of going into making sure that your that the provider that is actually calculating the footprint has the right kind of data. I wondered also if it was a, a a question of boundaries where the city and what they're actually qualifying as part of their footprint. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, yes, transportation, first and foremost, it's going to be a big pull input. Like that's our big challenge and that's everywhere. And then energy in buildings. So just <coughs> wanted to raise my hand, say that I'm willing to help and get involved because this is an area that I'd love to connect projects at the community level that help us achieve our targets for the climate action planning. Okay. Great. All right. Hey, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, can I circle back to what Lonnie brought up? Because I think this is really important. Uh, I'm looking right now on my own computer at the table, maybe Patrick, you can bring it up. Sure. Um, from the report that shows the difference between 2010 and 2018 GHG emissions for the city. Table number? Uh, it's page three of the report. Uh, table uh, three two. of the 2018 report, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, and Lonnie, I'd really like to establish if, if we can right here, right now, look at the community generated waste line down below. Yeah which has 23,090, uh, I, I guess, metric tons emission equivalent or something. Uh, how does, where, where did that number come from? And how does it compare to the number that you put up for Lambs Canyon, which was much larger, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, Rob, which, which table? Wait, wait, say again. Table, okay, so, so table where two, am I? bottom of page three. Yeah. And it's it. the solid waste and it's the top line, yep. Yep. Yeah. How does it compare? Okay, so for uh, you, you, if you look at, uh, are you talking about fertilizer application, natural land? No, you couldn't be no. cut back because those are all negative numbers. No, no. Okay. I'm looking just at the solid waste because that 23,090 oh. is coming oh, from okay. somewhere. So, it, okay. it's, so for instance, yeah. that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, uh, solid waste, they're looking at former Palm Springs landfill. No, they have two. No, that's, that's a separate, separate line item. Eden Hill. Okay, so let you want to compare the numbers. So Edom Hill is 1,350 megatons CO2 equivalent. And Lamb Canyon is 80,000. Right. So that's what I'm very curious about. There's a huge discrepancy between 80,000 and 23,090. I believe that those are waste numbers. I don't think that those are air emissions numbers. Uh, oh, so they're not yeah, even, these, we're not making apples and these, oranges. Right, these are CO2 emissions. Those are, are waste transfer numbers. Right. No, no. No? Uh, these are CO2. These are 80, these aren't tons of garbage. You also have to consider the protocols they use to estimate those emissions and what emission factors they were using based on the volumes that they were calculated with. So I would, to add additional clarity to this, would ask the provider of that bill of lading on the weights to ask them what protocols do they use and the emission factors that are using to convert that into 
metric tons of CO2 emission. Well, CO2 equivalent. furthermore, I spoke to them. Am I muted or not? No, nope, you, you are. You're on. You're on. I spoke to them. I had an extra meeting. There was a meeting I missed where they were. They spoke to our uh, subcommittee, and I get, wasn't able to make it. I made a special appointment. I spoke to them. They. Um, I can't remember the name. Sorry, but they very clearly told me that Lamb Canyon was not included. I don't want to right. spend too much time with these folks because honestly, I want to get working. I want to get, do something. I don't no, want to. I, so I believe, I, and this is what we'll clarify with them, but I believe okay. what that, we, they were saying is that that landfill is not in Palm Springs boundary. So that landfill is not included, but the waste that we, the waste that we send there is included. So the waste that we send to Lance Canyon should be accounted for in that that line that says community generated waste. Yeah, so it's it, it's it's accounted for in Lamb Canyon. Right. right. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's funny because Palm Springs, you know, everybody knows Palm Springs. We don't happen to have a landfill. Well, what a surprise. But it, but if there's no just if that's the number, if that's the amount that's going from Palm Springs to Lamb's Canyon, then we don't have an issue here. If, if that is actually 23,090, as, as opposed to, to the number Lonnie you showed, which is way higher. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's so what we're going we to that. just clarify with them when we get the backup data. I've checked okay. it out. Okay. But go ahead. I think you should too. Yeah. So, all right. Any other questions about those reports? All right, so we'll have uh, further discussion uh, maybe in the Solar and Green Building Committee, uh, commission, uh, committee meeting. Uh, when we get the 2020 look ahead too. So, all right, um, I think that's it for that topic. And then the last thing I wanted to mention under old business was the demonstration garden for the airport. Uh, we had another small meeting of our um, subcommittee uh, or ad hoc committee to uh, discuss the turf conversion project. We did talk about a couple of things, as I noted in the report, including a um, public art piece um, on one end of the uh, demonstration garden and uh, some other items like signage. So uh, let me just highlight those for you guys and see if you had any questions or concerns. Uh, we're basically in the finalization process for the uh, garden itself, especially the plant layout. Um, and so that we can get into the construction documents and, and start to get some quotes on uh, what it's going to take to build this. So basically where we are right now uh, is here. Um, this uh, diagram shows you the updated drawings for the garden that have this meandering path down the middle. Um, that path is going to be a vegetated path. Uh, it's not really a walking path, uh, but it'll kind of simulate a little stream that goes through the, the middle of the garden. Uh, we talked about, uh, most uh, recently, we talked about the uh, opportunity for a um, public art sculpture at the end of the garden. So this sculpture would have to meet very strict criteria in terms of height and obstruction uh, to make sure that it didn't obstruct the, uh, the view into the airport as well as the view out to the mountains. Um, and uh, it would be about, I think, I think we estimated about uh, six feet wide, maybe up to six feet wide. So, uh, and then we had would have to have extra pavement around it so that people could walk around it based on ADA requirements. And then just opposite that, we would have a, the signage for the garden itself. Um, so uh, that is the layout that we've sort of zeroed in on. Um, and uh, the small group was supportive of that idea. And I have reached out to the Public Arts Commission to see if they are interested in working with us on that. This is something that they would kind of identify and pay for and install, um, but we would be uh, uh, reviewers uh, for that piece of art. So, so we talked about that and um, any questions about that element? And uh, okay. All right. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Who is that? Alex. Hi, Alex. Hey, is this demonstration garden for the Mayor's Monarch Pledge? No. I 
it, it will have a pollinator. It will have pollinating uh, pollinator plants in it. Okay. Uh, but it's not, and and we are actually counting it towards the mayor's monarch pledge. But okay, yeah. But it wasn't fun. done for that purpose. Perfect. Yeah, I saw milkweed on there, so I was just wondering if you check that box there on your pledge. Too. Yes, it does. It accomplishes several things for us, I think. Great. So, yep. Okay. Um, the other thing we talked about in our small group was, uh, and and actually, just feel free if I'm if I'm not seeing your hand up or something, just chime in. So um, it's I can only see about six of you on my screen at one time. Uh, so then uh, the other thing we talked about was signage. And so we talked about trying to figure out uh, kind of an appropriate shape to kind of mirror the uh, shape of the airport. So we kind of landed on a hexagonal shape. And uh, so we'll have basic information there about the garden. We'll keep it pretty high level um, and as to kind of what it does and what it's meant to show. Um, we will have sponsor information to the extent that we can uh, get some sponsors to maybe help us out with plantings and things like that. Um, and uh, basically when you look towards the garden, this is what you'll see, it'll be at an angle. Um, and we're working on trying to figure out the, the appropriate material given our hot weather here, we won't, don't want anybody frying themselves on the, on the sign. Um, and then out in the garden itself, we have these smaller planting signs where that's where we'll get into information about the plants and how to get them and where they, where they might be, grow best and that kind of thing. So we want it to be informative for folks, uh, but we also want it to be fairly flexible uh, because we're not sure how some of these are going to survive. We, we think we've made good choices, but you never know out here. Um, and so we're going to use uh, QR codes uh, to help people identify and uh, get more information on what's out there. And so that gives us a chance to modify things if we need to do that. So, um, all right. And we're still working on things like name and um, gravel and stuff like that. Some of those little details we're, we're trying to work out as well. But, uh, but basically, we're, we're, uh, I think we're pretty solid on the overall design and some of those key features. So uh, any questions on, on anything you heard? Okay, so yeah, Lonnie. Just one comment. Um, it's, to it's very much intended to be kind of a moving target because it is gardening and it's gardening in the desert. It's going to be unique. Right. It's very exciting and a lot of people, they spend years and years and years here and they're trying to figure out what the heck, you know, there, there are only five plants that will live here or what's the deal, you know, but they, but I think we're going to, it's, I think it's going to be really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Super. Well, thanks guys. Um, and I'm going to present this to the airport commission tomorrow. Um, just to make sure that they are bought in as well. I've been trying to include them all along the way. And uh, so hopefully no surprises at the end. So After, oh, one real quick question. Yeah, uh, as far as any public art that would then be coming in from um, the different uh, group, would they not only in, um, install it, uh, but would they also then maintain it? Uh, over time? No. Uh, uh, well, oh, I'm sorry, the public art. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's a really good question. And I don't know how they work. I believe that they do maintain the, the, the art that they install uh, because that came up a lot with the benches. Um, they wanted to make it clear that they would maintain the benches and, and refurbish them as needed. So so I believe that once they do the art, then they are, they're sort of responsible for that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So, yep. Jim. Patrick, is the timeline for this that they're going to plant this before the brutal summer starts? Because either we need to do this urgently or no. later. Okay, no. uh, we we are going to go out to bid probably in the next month or so, um, and then we'll take bids probably early summer. And then um, what we'll do is we'll work with whoever we select to start selecting the plants and reserving them uh, so that they're ready to go in the fall, which is when okay. we do the planting. Okay. Good, thank you. Which should work out really well because I think that it'll be ugliest in the time when it's hottest. So we're gonna, we gotta kill the grass in the summer. Um, you know, people, not as many people are coming in then. So hopefully by the time October, late October, November rolls around, we'll have stuff planted and, and it'll be beautiful when flights start to come back. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. 
Yeah, okay. Lonnie. I just want to, you know, for our new members, I just wanted to say that this is being done in conjunction with the Desert Water Agency. They're, they've got, um, we have extra, they, we <laughs> have extra funding to take out all of the grass in the area and to re redo the irrigation, which is a big deal and to make it low water. So, you know, it's, it's got, it's multi-purpose. It's got a lot of messages. Thank you. So um, I also just, before we go on to the next item, um, Roy, there was a question uh, uh, in the chat box. And I did want to mention this at the beginning of the meeting. We do have a little bit different administrative process moving forward. You saw that in the agenda that was posted where they divided up the, the items and we typically give it to you guys as a package. So I will continue to give it to you all as a package. Um, and uh, we'll have to figure out if there might be an alternative way to post that, but, but we're moving to a different format for post things, so. Um, and I, Patrick, I think that the format of the agenda that's available on the website does have links at various items. It does. So not all of the presentations are in one package. They can be accessed that way. Right, right. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it just makes it a little bit harder if you're trying to view the whole thing together. But, uh, but yes, the links are there. Okay. Okay, thank you, Patrick. The, um, there's nothing for new business. So we'll move now on to subcommittee and commissioner reports. And the first is the standing subcommittee on solar and green building. David. All right, thank you. Um, lots going on as always, comprehensive report, couple of highlights. <coughs> um, there is a new wind project going out, um, not in the city limits, but across the railroad track. So um, they're doing some uh, public outreach for that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll continue to follow that. Uh, Tracy, did you ever hear back from uh, the OEA folks on that case study? Yes, they confirmed uh, receipt of the article. They have not advised of a date. It's going to be published, but it has been confirmed and we've had communications with them. Great, okay, so that's good then. All right, um, there's a lot going on in the regulatory front as the details are in the report. Uh, there was um, a, the Energy Commission held a uh, public scoping meeting uh, on uh, April 9th for the 2022 Energy Code uh, Environmental Impact Report and public comment ended yesterday and the draft EIR will be issued in early May followed by a 45-day public comment period at its uh, business meeting last week on April 14th. Uh, the Energy Commission referred a petition submitted by AIA California and the American Institute of Architects to add a set of renewable energy measures to the voluntary Cal Green appendices um, to the pending Cal Green regulatory proceeding. There are now 44 approved approved reach codes covering almost a third of the state population and at least one more will be um, on the agenda for the uh, May uh, Energy Commission business meeting. I am starting to work on the possible energy efficiency measures for Palm Springs using the reach codes cost effectiveness explore. So I think that's one of the measures that Patrick was alluding to when he said I would be working on this. And the objective is having it ready for the May uh, uh, subcommittee uh, meeting, Green Building Solar, and then, um, then the uh, commission meeting uh, later in May. Um, the reach codes team has asked to quote me on an article on the Explorer in the next issue of the, um, the newsletters of Patrick. Is that okay? And whether you had a chance to look at that. <laughs> Uh, if not, you can get back to me next week on that. No, next tomorrow or whatever I, I sent you that. So uh, yesterday. Anyway, you can let me know about that. But they've asked. Uh, they've asked to quote me um, as sort of the uh, poster kid for their uh, for the Reach Codes Explorer. And then also, I've been asked to speak on a panel on the Explorer um, at the Municipal Green Building Conference and Expo next month. And we're waiting to hear back whether that panel's been accepted. And then SB 617 on automated solar permitting was amended yesterday, has been set for a Senate committee hearing next Monday. Uh, this coming Friday afternoon, I'll be joining CVAG in a virtual meeting with the um, NREL team that's developed uh, the solar app. I'll report back at the next month's committee and commission meetings. And Patrick, let me know also if you want to join us, but that's a Friday afternoon. So I'm happy to take care of that and report back. Okay, got it. 
<laughs> okay, you'll hear for it. It'll be on the agenda for the committee meeting then. All right, that's it. There's just a lot going on. Um, never a dull moment up in Sacramento. There is a bill that also I just saw an alert for um, that I'll look into involving um, solar metering, and I need to do some research on that because um, that was I just saw a Facebook post uh, uh, a few hours ago on that. So that's it, for at least on the on energy uh, uh, at Green Building Solar. Uh, so one one quick addition to that um, uh, uh, that I did have a initial meeting with our new city manager, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was very positive. Uh, he was very encouraging. He is very hands off and very supportive of the things that we are doing, um, and in particular. He had some very similar observations that I had when I started working here at City Hall in terms of the building and the infrastructure and the lights being on and the <laughs> the water use and all this stuff. So anyway, so I think he's totally on board to support us in various ways to help us um, uh, address our own um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and energy use, et cetera. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And there are various sort of projects funding for municipal building mm -hmm. retrofit. So I kind of do continue to do that. Obviously, mm -hmm. we have a class one Albert Frey historic building with a leaky roof on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe with all of the extra money the city council seems to have found or right. discussed on. Uh, so you can ask them uh, since they seem to be OK on the money side as for uh, Thursday's council agenda, whether any of that could be devoted to uh, any capital project to some retrofits, energy efficiency retrofits for City Hall. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Are there any more questions for Commissioner Friedman? Thank you. And we'll move on to the Standing Subcommittee on Waste Reduction. Patrick. Okay. So uh, just a couple of updates. Um, we have primarily been focusing on SB 1383, which culminated in that presentation at the last council meeting. We continue to work with Palm Street's disposal on addressing um, the changes that need to be made to the franchise agreement. Uh, we think that we are pretty close to understanding what the scope of those changes are gonna be. So uh, this week we should be getting a bunch of information back from them, uh, which we will be reviewing with them to uh, figure out how to move forward with all of that. Um, so that's certainly the big, uh, our big focus here moving forward. Um, and I wanted to also clarify that the extraordinary rate increase that I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that may come up at the May 6th council meeting uh, is is independent of SB 1383 cost increases. So the, uh, as you all know, the recycling markets have changed drastically over the last few years. Uh, a lot of recycling companies and waste hauling companies um, did not anticipate those costs. And so they uh, often are seeking reimbursement for many of the increased costs that they incurred as a result of the changing markets and transportation costs, et cetera. So um, that extraordinary rate increase actually relates to those fees and costs and not 1383 yet. Um, so uh, we are trying to organize the information that goes out to council and to the public about these various rate increases so as not to confuse people. Um, so we have yet to see what all those increases mean in terms of dollars. Um, but we want to make sure that we have our story clear uh, before we go out and share that. So, so that's another big thing that we're focused on. Um, and then the other thing, uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, we did finish, uh, finalize the graphics for that downtown trash and recycling container signage. We just need to purchase the rights to, to the pictures. And then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, print those up and uh, put those around the city on the recycling containers. And then the other thing was um, composting. We had another meeting of the composting crew here who's uh, been very active and interested and engaged in developing a community composting program. Um, the, uh, it's, still, it's still sort of in the formulation stage and the group mm -hmm. is trying to figure out exactly where and what it's going to look like. Um, 
And uh, so we are continue to monitor that and engage with that group. And, and Lonnie has agreed to uh, kind of liaise with them as they move forward. So uh, we'll look to her and to Jake, actually. Jake was on that call as well. So um, look forward to doing more with that uh, in the future. Um, and I think that's really about it. Other stuff in their report, Lonnie. Uh, uh, the wastewater treatment uh, plan capital improvements report, we still haven't received, but it seemed like you had an update on, on the next dates coming up. There might be a So report. that report is out. It is on the agenda for the meeting on Thursday. Oh, so it's out. Okay. It's out. So yes. Finally. Yes, so I encourage you to take a look at that agenda. It is the last agenda item for um, the meeting on Thursday. And it is a very long report, so. All right, any other questions? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I wanted to mention before, and, and I noticed there's a, there's a huge disparity in um, rates I've seen in San Francisco where they have almost 100% recycling. And their rates are almost five times what they are here. And I mentioned before, that they strongly advocate for volume-based trash removal. So they have like 25, 60, 35, 65, and 90 gallon bins, and the price goes up um, a lot in the, in the bin size. And that's something we don't have. And it's like it's a good way to, to accommodate rate increases and also encourage um, reduction of waste. So that might be something we would want to kind of keep in our back pocket. Yeah, that, that is something that I uh, had encouraged Chris to think about when they come back with their potential rates for uh, moving forward. Great, thanks. And we actually had a really good model. I think Oceanside sent us their information about how they calculated their rates and it's, it's, a, it's similar. So it encourages people in the right direction, so. It includes weight as well? It does, I, I don't think Oceanside includes weight. It includes the type of material. So they charge more for trash than they do for other stuff. Yeah. So, okay. All right, that's it. That's all I've got for that. If there are no other questions on waste reduction, we'll move on to World Environment Day. Jennifer? Mm. We are going to be meeting the Environmental Education Collaborative tomorrow night to decide um, what kind of a virtual World Environment Day celebration we'll have on June 5th and also decide a little bit more about who is going to be doing the judging of the various art contests. So if any of you are interested in being judges, um, let me know because it would be nice to have the representation from the commission and um, I think at last check, we have 34 submissions already. So that's good, but we're hoping for a lot more since we have the three categories. And um, if any of you have, you know, any age artists, so, you know, it's open pre-K through 12 and we have a special needs category and adult. So any visual artists, literary artists or performing artists um, are welcome to participate. Is that in person, you, not uh, virtual? No, it's virtual. It's going to have to be virtual this year, again, sadly. It's sad because it's a Saturday. It would be a perfect time to gather, but uh -huh. um, hopefully it's, next it's year. Saturday. Have you, you say? It's the Saturday for the judging? No, the, the submissions are due on May 15th. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. Yeah, so we'll, we have... Um, I don't know if it's another three weeks, something like that only between now and then. So, um, you know, it's been blasted out through both county offices of education. And, you know, I've asked them to send out another just to all the teachers on Earth Day, just as a reminder and maybe a little inspiration on Thursday. And so, yeah. If you need a, if you need a judge, I, I'm happy to, I can do that. We do, thank you. Love to have you. Jennifer, I'd be happy to also enjoy awesome. it last year. Fantastic. Is that going to be, is the judging also going to be virtual or will that yeah. be? Yeah, okay. it's all virtual, which is pretty amazing, you know, that we can do it like this. So I'm, I'm glad that in the pandemic, we can still continue on in some capacity. So it's good. Excellent. Thanks for your work on this. Oh, my pleasure.
And then good, I'll, I'll judge project. again. For, I'll judge again this year also. Thank you, Carl. Wonderful. And you don't have to let me know right now. You can let me know in the next couple of weeks or however. So I think that's it. So um, I did have one addition um, uh, to that topic. Um, we did not, uh, we're not able to connect on a movie for Earth Day this year. Um, but if you would like to do a movie related to World Environment Day, um, we're happy to work with the cultural center to make that happen. So, uh, yeah, so if you're interested in doing something like that, yeah. um, to do something the night before, the day of, or the something night like before that. could be great. That's a great idea, or yeah. maybe the day of also. Yep. Great, Patrick. That's fun. Yeah. So, so uh, if you are, then what I'll do is I'll let Eric at the Palm Springs Cultural Center know, and um, we'll work on finding a movie. Who did you say? Eric at the uh, Palm Springs Cultural Center. He's the oh. manager over there. Oh, I don't think I know Eric. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll loop you guys in. Okay. Thanks yeah. so much. Sure. That's great. Okay. Are there any other questions for Jennifer? Then the next subcommittee is the Ad Hoc Subcommittee on Walkability and Pedestrian Planning. We'll be giving the report on that. So uh, I'll, I'll do that uh, just quickly. We have finished all of the virtual walk audits in, um, uh, that were conducted by the consultant. And so we are wrapping up the data collection phase of this effort. Uh, so we are also gonna be sending out notices and reminders to people that if they want to uh, provide any additional input on our pedestrian surveys to do so before the end of the month, so that they can compile all that data and uh, start to work through and identify priorities uh, based on uh, the information people have provided and also accident data. So um, the thing that I was gonna mention about that is, is what? Um, I can't remember if there was another point I wanted to make about that. I think, I, th I, don't, I don't think so. Um, we have had, a really good response uh, to the surveys. Uh, I think they said we had 120 responses to date so far, so which I think is actually really good. So um, anyway, so we've gotten a lot of good data and uh, what I, is nice about the data is that it appears to be reinforcing. So a lot of times you get, do these surveys and there are things that are random all over the place, but this seems to be very focused and, and actually zeroing in on a lot of the same problem areas. So. So that's good. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Patrick. And we'll move on to the ad hoc subcommittee on bicycle routes and cycling. Commissioner Flanagan. Um, most of what we've covered is written up by uh, in the staff report by Patrick, thank you. But after hearing our greenhouse gas report, maybe we might consider converting all of Palm Canyon to bicycles only. Um, <laughs> Something to think about. <laughs> um, the, the one other thing I'll say is that we did kind of defer um, from meeting with traffic engineering um, to um, meet with planning instead. And I, I kind of make sense that we want to kind of get this um, on the planning radar before we get the details. So a lot of the questions that came up last week were about the cost and the feasibility and things that really will come from traffic. And I was thinking I could kind of dig up some numbers and some ideas, but I don't think my, um, my, um, grassroots research would really help much. So I think we're gonna to wait to answer those questions till after we've met with planning and maybe get some more information from, from traffic. So other than that, um, we're looking forward to meeting hopefully some point with David Newell and just kind of bring up some of our ideas. But that's about it for us. Thank you, Jim. Any questions for Jim? I'd be, I'd be interested to find out, I'm a primary cyclist as well and sort of navigating my way through the city and find that a lot of the bike routes are a bit disconnected. And so I'd be interested to join your committee to just kind of learn more. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, I last week I went to the dentist out north of, or yeah, no, east of the airport and found that there's really no bike route. Like I couldn't even route a bike path from where I'm staying out to modern dentistry, which is out where the Lowe's and the Bed Bath and & Beyond and everything. And I 
had to ride through the airport in order to get there safely or ride on a, a sidewalk. And I thought it was interesting that Ramon is a bit of this like dead zone. And so I was curious if that was part of the expansion program or just making sure that if an area within the city limits is also connected through a bicycle network would be something that, so I don't mean to take up time today, but Jim, I can connect with you, but it'd be great to yeah. sort of see like what some of the plans are in terms of making a more contiguous biking network so that people can actually legitimately stay off their bikes or stay out of their cars and get in the bikes, which obviously has a huge benefit to the community in terms of its GHG inventory. But um, so that, that would be, that would be great. We could definitely use you. And uh, yeah, there are some great bike maps and once you get used to riding, there are bike trails. They're just kind of hidden. You kind of get used to them, but and I've got some stuff I can share with you, but do we have contact information for the new members, um, uh, Tracy or, or Patrick? We do. Okay. And um, we will provide that after the meeting. Okay. I'll, I'll reach out to you, Jake, and send you a little. We just note. want to make oh, sure they took their oath, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'll share that the, the plans are top secret, but now that you've taken the oath. Okay, <laughs> good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jake. Um, the next um, ad hoc property is Night Sky. Rob? Hey. Uh, Let's see, the, the, uh, the major development over the last month is um, uh, David Friedman, primarily, but not exclusively. Uh, I did revise <laughs> our document uh, to incorporate all of your suggestions. Um, and uh, I think the one that I left out, which so, so I need to do one more revision to it, is about the, um, uh, when you're doing a, a major remodel of an existing property, then we, that gives us an opportunity to put some of these guidelines in for, for those. And I, I didn't do that, so I've got to do that. Um, the, other, the other major difference in the document is that uh, I discovered that um, there is a model lighting ordinance that I've been going off of that's a joint uh, collaboration between the International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. And they recommend uh, different uh, requirements for different lighting zones. And it, it turns out those lighting zones actually map directly onto the land use zones that we already have for the city of Palm Springs. So I think we've got a nice mapping there that we'll be able to use. And, uh, and I think Patrick, the next step then is with this new document that we need to um, provide it to city council. Is that correct? So what we will do is I will submit it or give it to Flynn, mm -hmm. who will run the idea by council and make sure that uh, kind of get there a little bit of informal feedback from them and then figure out how to deliver it to them. Okay, very good. Yep. Or, or rather how to get it to planning commission so that they could, it can go through planning commission and then on to council. All right, let me uh, just uh, throw out to one more thing uh, for our two new commissioners, um, we are actively soliciting uh, help on our subcommittee for Dark Skies. There's a lot of outreach and a lot of coordinating work that needs to be done with other desert cities. And if either of you are interested, we would love to have you. I would love to join. You would? Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was on my that. list, actually, ah. <laughs> of interest. So that's Alex, right? Yes. Great. OK, and that's all I have. Are there any more questions for Rob? Then we'll move on to the Ad Hoc Subcommittee on Strategic Planning and General Plan Update. Patrick? Nothing to report. Okay. Water conservation. David? Uh, thank you. A couple of things. Uh, first, uh, DWA will record the uh, Thursday's Earth Day webinar with Patrick on the Mayor's Water Conservation Challenge and other conservation initiatives, and they'll post it on their website starting next Monday. So if you don't get a chance to watch it live at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning, uh, then you can um, uh, look for it on the DWA website under virtual. Uh, so far, we're in 47th place in our population category for the mayor's challenge. So we need to do a little bit better. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, the DWA board met this morning, couple of action items to report back on. They agreed 
to increase the bill assistance that cre uh, credit that customers can receive through United Way of the desert to $200 per year. And they're working on an outreach campaign to spread the word. And Patrick, perhaps you can also coordinate with Ashley to make sure that there's a, you know, that that information is available also on our, on our website. So um, just <laughs> making sure that folks know about that. Um, to, uh, I agree entirely with uh, Commissioner Miller's uh, point that uh, DWA is funding a very large amount of the demonstration garden. So I did give them an update this morning at the board meeting and thank them for their assistance. And of course, also thank them for uh, doing the webinar on Thursday with Patrick. Uh, and then finally, DWA and his customers achieved an 11% reduction in metered potable water consumption during the month of March 2021, compared to the same month in the 2013 baseline year. And that's right in the middle of their target of 10 to 13% reduction. That target may move um, when they get the state numbers, um, part of the uh, water conservation requirements, um, but for the moment we're on target. And that's it for water. Are there any questions for Commissioner Friedman? Uh, so just a couple of additions. Um, so in addition to talking about the mayor's water pledge, which will be like two seconds on that webinar, we're also talking about um, the sprinkler check week that we're promoting uh, the last week in April. Uh, we're uh, going to get out our social media stuff uh, here shortly. I've uh, worked with Denise to get it out to all the neighborhood organizations. And also we're running radio ads on Spanish and English stations next week. Uh, so it's really just an effort to get people more aware of their sprinkler situation and to take a look at their irrigation system to make sure that they don't have big leaks and um, are adjusting sprays so that they're not spraying concrete. Um, and so anyway, so hopefully it'll raise a little bit of awareness. And then next, in, the, in the fall, we'll do it again um, because everybody changes their schedules in the spring and fall. So I uh, want to make sure that they keep thinking about it. And DWA has lots of incentives uh, to help people pay for changes to the extent that they need to do that. So we'll be talking about that. Um, and also on the waterfront, um, I also wanted to mention that uh, I have requested that the city start to set aside funding from the general fund to fund uh, turf conversion efforts and water efficiency efforts across the city. So I think we need to be much more strategic about that and have a set pot of money set aside so that we can do projects every year as opposed to once in a while, like the one we're doing at the at the uh, airport. Um, so I think that the airport should also do the same thing and set aside some of their budget because they got a ton of grass over there. So um, anyway, so I think that this these next few months in particular with uh, talk of drought uh, we are going to be um, more scrutinized uh, than normal uh, for our activities in addition to trying to get the word out to other, other people to do things as well. So, so that, uh, I just wanted to mention those things. Uh, Patrick, several years ago, and I've lost track, but um, uh, Stacy would know this, we had discussed a um, project at Victoria Park, and I'm not sure there's sort of extra grass there that can be uh, converted into uh, desertscaping and you know, the airport garden kind of took priority, but mm -hmm. that's also on the list of, yep. uh, of additional areas. Yeah, I think we've even got the design information for that. So uh, I think it was just a matter of getting a few more quotes and getting the money. So, and I, actually it wasn't too expensive. So I, I think we should be able to do that. And, and also I want to put in a plug for the uh, leak, uh, leak device that, uh, the, that, uh, um, it is recommended. I've had it. It's very accurate. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been really sort of changes how I measure things. I now know exactly how many gallons are going when I've got the system running. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I've been able to reduce my water consumption. So I think Ashley will mention that as well. But um, I've been using it since uh, I had my leak in uh, January. And it's very, very good and uh, will pay for itself quickly. Good. Are there any programs around um, sort of upcycling water in the city? I'm not as familiar with their purple pipe program or whether or not they're looking to promote like on site, like even residential homes doing laundry to lawn or anything like that. Is that discouraged? Is that hard to permit? 
someone wants to table this or just send me a link to a place where I could do some research and not take up all of your time today. But I'm just curious, like, sure, there's a lot of avoided water use, but there's also leveraging the water consumption that actually occurs and getting it reused on site. Patrick, do you want me to answer that or you want to take care of it? Up to you. Sure. I'm my hand raised. Okay. Okay. All right, well, maybe Lonnie go first. And, yeah, sure. Okay, um, so the first thing I do is I would uh, look at your bill online on both sides of that page. And uh, in the last, well, during the last drought, they did a lot of work because of, you know, uh, public pressure to define exactly what your water usage has been. And they've got a little bit of a different, uh, calculus now, but it still basically works. And you can actually see how much you're using, catch the leaks and whatnot. But on the back, they're having a lot of like webinars. This is this is the DWA. They're very active. Okay. They, um, uh, the webinars, and then on the back of that, every month, there's a whole lot of information that comes out. And you can go to the website. They want you to report. You know, when there's a big leak, they want you to report that. Mm -hmm. And there's some, you know, numbers that you can call and whatnot. Yeah. Um, to yeah, answer, that yeah, answers your question, but I, yeah. I just think that's a, a really good resource to start with. Yeah. Yeah. To, um, so the actually DWA does have a recycled water plant. The challenge, and unfortunately I look at it every day, um, is that they have now more recycled water than they use. One of the largest consumers of the water is the, uh, what you can see literally in my background, is the Indian Canyons golf course. And um, they were one of the original users and pipes were extended out literally in front of my house um, to get to the golf course. And the tribe, of course, the decision of tribal sovereignty, uh, they decided to no longer uh, use the uh, uh, recycled water program. And I believe are just using essentially well water um, uh, so uh, there's actually more uh, recycled water. So DWA is kind of on it. Um, I actually asked them to look into working with residents. So I would love, particularly since the pipe is in front of my house, I told them <laughs> that I personally would love to, um, you know, and I'll pay for it to have a connection to get recycled water for my, uh, for my rather extensive irrigation system because um, I use a lot of water to grow my food. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens. So there aren't purple pipes, but there, there aren't purple pipes in the houses, but um, the sewage basically goes in to the city secondary system and then into the tertiary system for DWA and they do recycle it. So we have it. Uh, we actually need more uses for it than we have. Thank you. Bonnie? Um, FYI, 75% of the water that's treated at the wastewater treatment plant ends up, it is recycled water, it's sent back to the DWA, 75%. But then they add a bunch of chemicals and stuff. They do, and then they still put it on the grass at, at the uh, Takowitz golf course. So there's, there are some issues there. As far as rainwater, none of that goes to the wastewater treatment plant. That's all I had. Are there any more questions on water? So we'll move on to wellness. Commissioner Baker. Hi, the um, Human, Rights Camp, Human Rights Commission met two weeks ago. And they just had one question that I spoke to you already about, Roy. <clears throat> they wanted to know if uh, back then Mayor Coors had spoken to the restaurant and hotel groups, which he has. So I gave them that information and they needed that to then redress to revisit the issue in the May meeting. So now we're waiting for them to revisit again with May after they ask for additional information. Thank you, Carl. And finally, Desert Community Energy. Okay, um, DWA board uh, met yesterday. Um, and as Patrick noted in the staff report, city council had considered 
um, possible changes to um, to D, uh, DCE's uh, um, renewable content, as well as suspending the uh, carbon-free uh, program for CARE and FIRA uh, customers. So they did uh, take action in line with the city council recommendation. Um, uh, carbon-free will be suspended for CARE for FIRA. They'll just get the, um, the uh, state requirement, which is currently 35.75% um, renewable content. And that will also be the same for carbon-free. And these are hopefully temporary measures to allow DCE to keep its finances stabilized over the next couple of years because they're dealing with rather substantial power price increases as a result of the market instability from uh, both uh, uh, what we saw in California and uh, around Labor Day and then also more recently in Texas. Um, the board also approved a support letter on SB 612, which Patrick mentioned also in its staff report. Um, and that would um, require the investor owned utilities to essentially share the legacy renewable resources <coughs> that they have. And um, that'll be also on the council agenda for, uh, for Thursday. And then finally, the new Terragen uh, wind project within the city limits will begin uh, operation the next few days and some photos from the PPA signing ceremony in February and also <laughs> information on DC's energy and cost savings in its first year in, of operation are in a couple of slides that were done for the board meeting. So Patrick and Tracy, maybe can just circulate those to our, to the commissioners. And, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Baker, there you are on my grid, um, for uh, for a very productive uh, working group meeting. And of course, Lenny, I, Commissioner Miller, I don't think I, you were at the last meeting. I did thank you for your service on the on the CAC. And that's it for DCE. A lot going on there as well. Thank you, David. Are there any any more questions for on DCE? Okay. So now we're at the last item on the agenda and that's commissioner comments and upcoming agenda. And for our new commissioners, um, just a brief explanation. We do this at the end of every meeting, we go around the virtual table and ask each uh, commissioner if he or she has any additional comments to make or any suggestions for the agenda for the uh, meeting in the following month. So we'll start with uh, Vice Chair McCann. Yeah, quick uh, comment that I want to direct in primarily to uh, to our new commissioner, Alex, because you have a conservationist background. And I'm wondering if, if Hoya Nip and uh, Deb McGarry are still on. Um, if you are, one of you is a, is a member of Friends of the Desert and uh, the other one is a member of the Sierra Club. So my point is uh, the, the other hat I wear these days is a, a board member of um, Oswood Land Trust. The, the local group is trying to save land all over the place and prevent development of open space. Uh, so I encourage you all to, to get involved in, in our group and, uh, and help us do it. We, we need all the help we can get. Um, uh, David, it may even, uh, this could even fit into, I was thinking earlier tonight, uh, if there are these, these drastic reductions that we're gonna try to achieve in carbon emissions, surely uh, preserving and saving open land and saving it from development uh, could play a role in that. That's it. Thank you, Rob. Commissioner Baker. Uh, nothing. Commissioner Flanagan. Nothing for anything. Okay. Commissioner Futterman. Nothing for me. Okay. Commissioner Garrett. Um, I've got a 7 a.m. Uh, phone interview with Erin Brockovich uh, for a piece she's working on in her newsletter. Um, and any input before uh, that meeting or specific to the city, we're um, discussing impact on individuals in my business, but she's also aware that I'm on this commission and she uh, is in New York now because of the new TV show, but uh, she lives here in the desert now and she's very concerned about the use of Roundup and similar classifications of dangerous poisons. So any input and uh, also my understanding, Patrick, if I'm correct, is that the city of Palm Springs does not allow that for their workers or on their, on their property. But as far as the citizens and businesses and retailers, they're free to do 
Is that correct? That's correct. We have no authority over over okay. their use of those. Okay. All right. So any uh, any input, let me know. It's an early morning call, and um, she would uh, really like to get active in the Coachella Valley with this issue. I think would be great. Thank you, Commissioner Gothier. No comment. Okay, Commissioner Miller. Any comment from Commissioner Miller? Yes, it's it's coming. It's coming. Why is you just muted yourself again? You're on mute. Patrick, you're nodding as if you can hear. <laughs> this is very, anybody lip read? Want well, to, uh, we translate? cannot hear you, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Miller, is, you've been on mute. Is there something you need to repeat? <laughs> Okay. Commissioner Okanyas. I did have a quick question. Um, thank you. Maybe for Patrick. Um, I'm just I'm showing my cards here. I have a soft spot for monarch butterflies. So I was just wondering, I saw it on the agenda, the monarch mayor's pledge. I was just wondering if you um, finalized your pledge items for that yet or, or what, what that's looking like for Palm Springs? Uh, actually, it's on my to-do list. Tracy drafted something and uh, we're gonna take a look at it and um, see what to submit. I'm happy to share it with you if you would like. Yeah. Um, I would be curious, coincidentally, I've been um, helping the city of Palm Desert with their Monarch Mayor's Pledge. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to share um, just ideas, but I, I love that Palm Springs is signing on. That's that's amazing. We'll have a whole corridor going down Coachella Valley, <laughs> hopefully one day. And, and Alex, uh, there's a, another group uh, in Palm Springs called Milkweed for Monarchs that's been active over a couple of years. And I can show you um, some information about what that group has done as well. Great, yeah, that, that would be great. I've always noticed that Palm Springs has, is great about putting milkweed everywhere, medians. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. Thank you, and Jake. No comment. Thank you. Thank you. So we're at the end of the meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, Chair Clark, just, I, I think you may have skipped over me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, very briefly, uh, no no agenda items, but I did one, which I didn't get a chance to do in Green Building Solar to uh, welcome our two new commissioners. Uh, and then Patrick, when I send you the agenda, you can circulate it also to our two new commissioners. And, uh, we meet um, on the sec to me the first Tuesday of the month at 10:30 uh, virtually. Maybe one day it'll be back to being in-person meetings, but uh, low carbon footprint Zoom meetings. So um, uh, you're welcome to join us and kind of have an idea of all the things we're we're, we're looking at. But very heavily kind of regulatory focus is a lot of what we're doing, uh, given there's so much state uh, policy being made in this area. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, David. And sorry for skipping over your name. Okay, so our next meeting will be at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021, and it will be by video teleconference. Uh, is there a, a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Thank you, Carl. Second? Second. Second. Third. <laughs> who, who seconded? That was Rob. I second. Okay, and I don't think there'll be any objection, so we won't vote and the meeting. <laughs> thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.